tuck away your personal electronic device. Yes, I, the Lord will deliver a younger version of Pastor Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> So Pastor Andrew uh, has to travel back to REM uh, to give a uh, Sunday sermon. So pray for him. He will return back to uh, this retreat uh, this afternoon. So pray for the safety. And God give us a uh, younger version of Pastor Andrew. And, and Cyrus uh, is, a, is a member of uh, REM. And we have the actually privilege to partner together in the Jamaica mission team uh, ministry. So I had the privilege to know Cyrus a little bit and to see uh, his uh, adorable mission kid. And, <laughs> and so that Pastor Andrew also uh, gave me the instruction to uh, definitely let the, this congregation know of uh, Cyrus' uh, testimony. So uh, that's uh, my way of uh, introduction to uh, uh, give the, the time to uh, Cyrus. So uh, before we start, I just want to commit this hour to the Lord and uh, bless the congregation. Uh, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in your presence because of this church and because of the abundant spiritual gifts you have bestowed on us. We thank you for Pastor Andrew. We thank you for Cyrus. Lord, protect Pastor Andrew as he travels back and forth. Anoint him while he preaches right now in REM. Lord, I also commit Cyrus to your throne. Anoint his mind and his heart and his mouth so that he can edify this congregation with your word. And Lord, this is the day you have made. We shall be glad in it. We worship you in your word. Open our heart. We are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I welcome, guys. Um, I'm just going to give my pointer here. To get started, and I'm hoping to get through this not quickly but efficiently uh, because then I gotta rush back to uh, REM. We have our basketball ministry, which uh, is usually around 2 o'clock, um, so I want to give myself some time to make it back. Not on time, I'm probably gonna be late. I have somebody covering for me, but I would like to. Uh, I don't really, I don't play. Uh, I used to play, I don't as much. Uh, the basketball ministry is, is just an outreach we have uh, to invite folks from the community to come and, and enjoy the game of basketball, but uh, also share the gospel with them. So, uh, I, I want to make that happen as well. I was told by Pastor Andrew about coming here and sharing with you guys a, a, a word. And I understand that theme of this weekend or uh, this retreat is how to be a missional community. Did I get that right? Is that kind of the theme? Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a familiar story that I'm sure, if not all, most of you are familiar with. Uh, but before I get to that story, I want to share with you my story. Um, of how I got here. I won't give you the, the long version because then that will be the whole time we're here. So I want to give you the short version and then we're going to dive into the text. So my story. And I want to use this point on my fancy little point to show you uh, my journey to the United States. So originally I'm from Iran, um, which is Uh, and so I come from a city in southern uh, Iran, which is called Shida. It's not here on the map, but it is there. So give you some context of why uh, I came here. Um, my my mother was was married to my father. And, uh, they were married for about twelve years. So. Uh, one of the things about my, my dad uh, is that he was, he was an abusive person to my mom. Uh, 
both on a physical level, psychological, emotional level. Um, and my mom went through that for a number of years, 12 years. It was their entire, and it was kind of like in, in the, you know, the context and the culture of Iran, it's like arranged marriages and kind of the norm. Um, things have changed. I'm not sure if that's the way it is now, but certainly when my mom and dad got married, that was kind of the deal. Uh, families would get together, they would say, oh, your husband or your, your son would make a great match for my daughter, and they would meet together as a family, and they're like, okay, this seems pretty good, so then they would get married. And they wouldn't, there's no courtship here, there's no dating, none of that really happens, or happened, so I'm not sure what it is now. So they didn't really get a chance to know each other, and, and uh, <coughs> And my mom certainly didn't get a chance to know who he was, my dad. And so they got involved in this marriage relationship with a lot of heartache, a lot of tears, um, a lot of trauma that took place, primarily for my mom. I mean, we got a taste of it. I remember some things of, you know, my dad doing some stuff. Uh, in particular to my brother, I feel like, you know, I was kind of a favorite in one sense that I didn't get the brunt of it. But I saw it. That is a different story in itself. So anyway, uh, after 12 years, my mom decided to come here. She didn't know how she was going to get here, but that was, she wanted to leave because she knew that if, if we stayed back home, we were going to be like our dad. And so she met someone. Um, she came here previous, uh, in 1996, she came here on a visitor visa. And she was just trying to figure out if there was any way she can stay here, get some kind of a permanent residency in the United States, which is extremely difficult for persons from the Middle East. It's really hard, very challenging. Um, and so my mom met a friend. Uh, this person was very intricate in how he helped us. He was a US citizen, and so he was able to help us. And so our journey, we left uh, Iran, we went to Turkey, um, in Istanbul, you know where that is. Uh, and we stayed there for about three months. We were there for about three months and still trying to get a visa to come to the States. Couldn't get a visa, but we did manage to get a visa to, to Spain, which is not America, but it was closer. So we went to Spain and we, we were hoping that our journey there would be short, maybe a few months, and then we get our visa to the States, and then we could come here. It didn't work out that way. There was a, a lot of trials when we were in Spain. We were there a total of nine months. Uh, we went to school for a while, um, and we were in Madrid, Barcelona, if you're familiar. Um, so we spent quite a few months there. We didn't expect to stay that long, but that was kind of how God worked it out. We got, my mom got really desperate when she was there, and so uh, there are people there who will, or foreigners, that will sell them. Uh, like fake passports uh, and fake visas and all of that. So my mom was really desperate. We spent a whole lot of money to try to get this fake papers. We go to the airport and uh, you know they knew it was fake. <laughs> so and they pull us in. We were I was ten. I was like nine or ten at the time. So I didn't remember exactly what was going on. I just knew that it was really tense in the air. And my mom was like next to me. She's crying. It's like what's going on? I thought we're going to, going to the United States. And so, long story short, uh, then they take us into this other room. And for one reason or another, they had mercy. They decided to let us stay. My mom and this friend of ours who was there with us was trying to bring us to the states. They were begging these Spanish officials, please let us stay. It was an honest mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, I don't know what happened, but they felt sorry for us, or whatever the case might have been, and they allowed us to stay. Um, they didn't deport us. And, and keep in mind that if we did get deported, my mom well, probably would have meant her life. Um, you just don't do that as a woman uh, in Iran. You just don't have those kind of rights. Uh, part of the reason she decided to, to leave for the state was because my father would refuse to give her a divorce. She wanted a divorce, she wanted to kind of take us and, um, to be with her, but he wouldn't allow that, so 
she felt like she had to do this. And so a few months later, we actually did get our papers, and we, we came here by the grace of God. So uh, that's a little bit of my story, but let's kind of um, go to the text. We're going to talk about the Good Samaritan today. So your, your Bible to uh, Luke 10, in the New Testament. Turn there, if you will. Do you identify with any of 
these folks, if I were to ask uh, who would identify with the priest, anybody raise their hand? You would identify with the priest? What about, what about the Levite? What about the Good Samaritan? Who identifies with them? Nobody? Nobody identifies with any of these folks? Okay, right, so I'm going to ask that question again once we get to the end. We'll see uh, what you guys come up with. So, before we even get to the three characters, uh, if you were to go back to the beginning of the text, you see that there's a lawyer who's asking Jesus this question. In, in our Alright, so let's, let's actually go back to the text. Um, so, behold, the lawyer stood up and put him to the test. Already you kind of get a sense that, first of all, the lawyer is not a lawyer that we think of, like a guy going to court, he knows the laws of the land. This is a lawyer, a lawyer with respect to the scriptures, okay? This is a religious guy, okay? Uh, you would put him in line with, like, the Pharisees. And he was a religious leader of the time. And so he knows the Bible. He knows the scriptures. And he's putting him to the text. He wants to know, what is Jesus going to say? He's trying to set him up, actually. Okay? So he says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Does that ring a bell in terms of that question? you remember another person asking Jesus the same question? Do you remember the guy's name or what he was known as? The rich young ruler. That's right. The rich young ruler. He, was, he asked the same question. Except, in, in this particular case, Jesus knows us and he knows our hearts. And so he knows that this guy is trying to set him up. And so, then he, when he goes on, he says to him, what is written in the law? You know the law, right? You're a lawyer. You know what's in the scriptures. How do you read it? And then he goes on, he gives a very good answer. He essentially combines the law into this next statement. Okay? Uh, and it's essentially uh, sums up even the Old and the New Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, so, and then Jesus is like, yeah, you got it. Your answer is correct. And then again, we get another insider's perspective into this guy, the lawyer that is. He says in verse 29, but he, that is the lawyer, is trying to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He knew what it meant. He knew what it meant when he said, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He understood that. He had the context. He was a religious leader. He understood the law and the prophet of the Old Testament. He knew it. But then he was like, let me give Jesus the benefit of the doubt. I may not know what he's talking about when he says neighbor. So he's asking, like, who is my neighbor then? He's, again, putting them to the test to figure out, I want to see what you're up to. Where are you going with this? Because he knew the law. He was familiar with it. Um, and then he goes on and, and he talks about the different... Uh, and mind you, this is a parable. What's a parable supposed to do? Teach. Right. It's supposed to teach. And uh, maybe, maybe this is you. Uh, a parable is a story that communicates a spiritual truth. That's what a parable is. So, some people would ask the question, uh, why do you think the Samaritan, or I'm sorry, why do you think uh, this person got robbed? Why did he get beaten? You know, some people would say, well, he deserved it because he was a very sinful person, and this was God's way of getting back to this guy because of all the sins that he had committed. One person would say. Uh, another would say, how come the, uh, the folks, the priest and the Levite didn't go on the other side? Well, they would say, because they didn't want to defile themselves. That's why they didn't go there. They didn't want to defile themselves, because then they would have to go back to the temple and offer sacrifices and all of that. But 
But what's the, the real answer? The real answer is there's no answer because this is a story and it's not real. Jesus is using this story to communicate something. These are not real people he's, he's talking about. He's just saying, he's trying to communicate this to this lawyer that who is my neighbor? And so these are fictitious characters, they're not real. And so sometimes people would say, well, I identify with such and such. You might, in terms of their character, meaning what they do, what their, where their heart is at, but you're not going to identify with, because these are not real people. So anyway, let's talk about them. Uh, we know that the lawyer and his heart isn't in the right place. Uh, and then we find out that Jesus tells them, man, he fell among robbers from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this is important because the where this guy was in the trail from Jericho or Jerusalem to Jericho, it's it's a tough route. Okay? Very hilly. It's, it's a tough place, even in terms of um, it's not if I could it's almost like a rough part of town, if you will. Okay? It, your nice folks would not be going this particular route. And so that's why there's some robbers there. Okay, so it makes sense in light of that. So they just rode to travel on. Um, and then why did something like this happen to this man? Well, we do live in a fallen world. Stuff like this, although this is not a real story, stuff like this does happen, right? Uh, where people will do some things because they want to take, they want to destroy, they want to rob, etc., whatever it might be. You probably know maybe friends of yours were maybe not something that their life was on the line, but they did something that was totally unfair and uncalled for. So then we're introduced now to the different characters. You have the priest, right? So um, he's a Jew. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see this uh, at the bottom. He's a Jew, he's a religious man. Uh, and, and priests play a very prominent role in the temple, offering sacrifices, etc. It's kind of like, imagine if you will, it's kind of like Pastor Andrew. Okay. <laughs> Just imagine if you will, if somebody like Pastor Andrew uh, was this character. Okay? But he, he didn't provide any help. So why? Why did he why did he not help him? He's supposed to be a religious, he's supposed to be a good person and try to help out. Especially this person who's almost dead. He didn't even go to the other side. He's like, I'm good. So let's find out. These are some uh, verses of scripture that will point out at least the first one. You go to Psalms 139, uh, you can turn it if you want, or you can just look up here. Uh, verses 21 and 20. This is the guy's mindset. He's zealot for this stuff. He's passionate about this stuff. He says, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Sometimes you can be so spiritual, you can be so into your own world with regard to spiritual things that you miss the big picture. Okay? And I think that's what happened to this guy. This priest was so about keeping the commandments, at least the selected ones that he chose to follow, and he forgot about all the other stuff. Okay? Because there are points of Scripture where it talks about the Leviticus 1934, you shall treat the stranger. We're talking about this guy who got robbed. He's a stranger. You don't know the man. With uh, you shall treat the sojourner who the stranger who sojourned with you as a native among you, meaning he's no different than your friends and your native folks. And you shall love him as yourself. Love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And then in Micah chapter 6, 6 to 8, what is that? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? 
Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the first of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? This is something that the lawyer is not familiar with. At least this is something that is not in his mind. The first one is more on his mind. This is what he's thinking about. The lawyer is, is somebody that you would identify with more so like a priest than a Levite. This, these are the religious leaders. The Levite is no different. He is an assistant to the priest. He doesn't have as high of a role. The role isn't as prominent, isn't as high. But he's still working in the temple. He has a religious role. A religious man provides no help. Doesn't help. Now we get to really the hero of our story. It's the Samaritan. And before we even talk about him, we need to understand what he was understood as. The Samaritan, they were known as half-breeds. Okay? They were known as evil persons. They were no good. They were, uh, because of their half-breed, um, they weren't looked as highly. But he was the one who actually took care of them. So it was an unlikely character. But one thing to note is that the Levite, the priest, these are folks who are doing some things that you and I do. You know, sometimes because we're so spiritual, we miss the picture that, yeah, I see the Levite in me. I see my selfishness. I see that I don't care for people as I ought. I see that I'm not passionate about helping people as I ought to be. I'm not loving people as I love myself. Because if I saw that person there, half dead, and if, if that was me, I would want somebody to help me. I would want somebody to bound up my wounds and take care of me and put me in it. I would want that, wouldn't you? Yes. And so, we have to understand that because of our sin, because of our selfishness and our pride, and maybe because sometimes we think of ourselves as too proud of a people to go over there and to help this person. I'm sure you've come across, you know, you come to a major interstate or a highway or uh, a street, and you'll see a homeless person there and asking for money or whatever the case might be. I'm not saying you should give them money. Uh, but you meet them where they're at, you help them. But so many times, and with myself, I'm not saying that I'm the exception here, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't even want to make eye contact. You, know, you just want to hang on to your steering wheel until the light turns green so you can be on your way. It's uncomfortable. Because at the back of your mind, you're saying, I should probably do something. I should do something for this person. But maybe because you're uncomfortable, maybe, maybe you're shy, maybe you just don't want to help the person. I don't know what the case might be for you, but I'm saying that we come across these instances in our own lives where you see a person in need and it's easy to walk on by from the other side. It's easy to identify with the Good Samaritan because he's a hero. He's a good guy. And it's easy to identify with him because that's what we want to be. We want to be liked. We want to be known as good people. But that's not the point. So it's a parent, Samaritan. He takes care of him. Let's go back to the text. Um, so let's see what he does. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, can't believe it, right? He saw him. And he had compassion. He had compassion on this person. He didn't just look at him from the other side. He went over there. He got real close. He got close and personal. He looked at him. He saw that he was hurt. He saw that he was bleeding. He saw that he barely had no clothes. And he knelt down probably and was looking at him. Was trying to figure out what's going on. How can I help? And he diagnosed the issue. 
and he had some stuff with him. He had some things that might be able to help him out. And so he put his head together. He said, yeah, in fact, he went on. Uh, he went to him and bound up his wound, pouring on oil and wine. So just imagine, if you will, you got your first aid with you. Okay, you take your mirror scoring out, and you start rubbing the guy. Okay, and you put on band-aids, and you wrap them up, and you put them, and what he does is he puts them on his animal. And we don't know what the animal was, but more than likely it was a donkey, a horse, or something like that. He puts them on there, and they walk to the head. So he, he's very methodical, he's very deliberate about what he wants to accomplish. And he didn't care about oil, and he didn't care about wine, and he didn't care about money. He gave all that up so that he could help this guy. There was no incentive. We don't know who this person was. For all we know, the guy who got beat, he could have been a homeless person. Or he could have been someone who had a lot of notoriety. We don't know. But he didn't care. He didn't care who he was. He didn't check his ID to figure out who he was. He just wanted to help the man. And he was very deliberate, very methodical about how he wanted to do it. So he goes in, and, and uh, this is important about currency. So uh, then he set up on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. So even while he's at the inn, he's still taking care of the guy. And we know that because the next day, he takes him to the inn, he stays with him overnight, taking care of him and meeting his every need. He spent the night with him. This guy went above and beyond for this man, a person he didn't know. He spent the night. He spent up. He spent money, and not only that, the next day uh, he took out two denarii. So, as I was again, as I was preparing for this, just to give you context for what how much that was, right there, um, they found like. Uh, in that region, in that region of the world, uh, there was some historical, uh, or historians that, were, that had found like a sign. And a, a night's stay, again, around that time, was uh, just a fraction of a denarii. So he gave them two denarii. Uh, they were suggesting that he could have probably stayed there for one or two months. Two months, enough money for him to stay for two months and to make sure that he gets healed up and he gets taken care of. He keeps going with this. I mean, he just doesn't stop in terms of how much he is loving this guy. And the word I would describe, and, and I got it from the great John MacArthur, if you guys know, but he lavishly loved this man. I mean, he kept going. He kept doing more and more and more. And not only that, after he drops two months worth of money for him to stay at this hotel, this inn, um, and by the way, hotel is probably not the right word, uh, where again, where they were, not the nicest part of town. So this was just, if you were in this situation where you're pretty much close to dying, or you just have to stop your journey there to pick it up the next day. He goes on, he says, take care of him. He's talking about the innkeeper now. And whatever more you spend, whatever you need to spend on this guy, I will repay you when I come back. Whatever you need to do to make sure this guy gets taken care of, I will come back and I will pay you all the funds. Whatever it takes, I will do it. Go back and you see why would a Samaritan do this? Why would a person who most people hate do this? Now again, we, we go back to the parable. He was trying to communicate something to this lawyer because he is puffed up in his mind about I know the law and I'm this righteous, this, this religious leader. I know what I'm doing, but I'm going to give you the benefit of that to let me know who his neighbor is. And then at the end of the day, who was his neighbor? 
The neighbor was this guy who had been beaten. And his neighbor was also the Samaritan. So then he goes in uh, verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man? The one who showed him mercy. At that point he knew. At that point, I'm sure some conviction fell in. And he saw that, you know, I think I may have gotten this a little twisted. I think what I thought I knew was completely incorrect and not valid. So, you know, that's, that's the story of Good Samaritan. Now, let's drive this home to you guys. Now we're talking about in light of living as a missional community. Okay. Picture for yourself, let's say you, you all became missionaries. Let's say all of you, were, wherever you feel like God is calling you. And you're going to be put in positions where, where God will entice you, God will convict you even, to take care of people. People that you don't know. People whose culture is completely different than yours. And at that point, you have to ask yourself the question, what is my motivation for helping this person? Is it because, well, I know this is what God wants me to do. This is, this is the right thing to do. Or, or is your motivation, going back to the gospel now, that Christ died for our place. And I like pictures. I like seeing what Jesus dying on the cross looked like. And so if you guys watch uh, a movie that uh, incorporates the crucifixion, you guys have watched the passion, I'm not sure it's going to be maybe a little challenging to watch. Um, you see what our Lord and Savior went through. He was whipped. He was lashed. bled. He was pierced. He went through a lot. And not only that, he was also at the same time carrying his instrument of death while going up that hill. He went through what none of us will probably ever go through. Not just the physical pain. Now we're also talking about the spiritual hurt that he felt towards the Father as God the Father turned his back on him in that moment when he was taking up all the sin of all of us. And so our motivation, I think, should be really rooted in the scriptures, rooted in the gospel message. What is your motivation for wanting to help people if you even desire that much? Do you desire to help people in need? Is that something that you think about? Does the story of the Good Samaritan, now that we've kind of talked about it and broke it down a little bit, who do you identify with? Is it the priest? Is it the Levite? Is it the Samaritan? Is it the lawyer? And so this is the... This is something that you're going to have to grapple with and wrestle with. So how, many, how many of you just raise a hand as growing up in the church? Grew up in the church. Okay, so I could say at least half, if not more than half. This is going to be a challenge for you because it's going to be so easy for you to be numb to this stuff. Okay, go to church Sunday, which we do this every year. And to kind of Make it one day, make it boring, or you might see it as boring. It's actually a great privilege that you have, but it's so easy, it, it's so easy to give in to those temptations that, okay, this is just what we do on Sundays. This is just what we do at this time of year. This is our annual mission trip or our, our annual retreat or annual whatever the case might be. But to not give up that moment to God and say, Lord, how would you? And ask the question, what would you do if you were in that situation? I think if we were all, if we were the person who was being robbed, we would all want somebody like a good Samaritan to come and help us. 
So now, what if we were not the person who was, who was there, but rather were one of the people who's walking by? What are we going to do? Are we going to help? Are we going to try to do something? And then again, what are, what are you being motivated by? What is your worldview? Those are big questions that all you need to answer. Hopefully, you've answered parts of them, if not entirely. Well, what are you going to do? What is the very thing that is driving you to do this stuff other than, well, I know I'm supposed to do it. I know my parents will probably want me to do this. Or I know that's what the Bible says. That's true. There's all facts, and they are probably good things. But are you being motivated by the very thing that you believe in or you say that you believe in? If I, if I say, I believe in Jesus, I believe that he died for my sins, then my actions should reflect that. Point blank. And so this story is not, it's a story that's very easy to understand. There aren't too many riddles here. Some of Jesus' tales had some areas where you have to kind of figure it out. This is pretty straightforward. And now, going and kind of wrapping this up, um, ask yourself a question. What would you do? What are you being motivated by? And as we're, you're talking about this, this retreat this weekend, how to be missional, what do you need to give up in order to be like the Good Samaritan? Are there things in your own life that's holding you back? Maybe you're into, uh, maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's an extracurricular activity. Um, maybe it's school. What I'm naming are forms of idolatry, or it can be. It can be. When you're so much into your own thing, whether it's sports, extracurriculars, hobbies, etc., uh, that you forget about the big picture. That that's not. That's not the main thing. The main thing is for me to follow after Christ and to follow His example. Uh, one, of the, one of the quotes that I often use uh, for the basketball ministry guys is uh, really Jesus' definition of love, uh, where he says, love has no one greater than this, that he who is willing to give up his life for his friends. He who is willing to give up his life. So what is your life, and what does that mean to you? Is that your definition of loving someone, to give up your life, give up everything that you have, and to, with reckless abandon even, follow after Christ? Well, these are good questions to answer, um, to reflect, to ponder. Because if, if you can't answer those questions, um, it's going to be mundane, and it's going to be boring. And you're not going to get a kick out of coming here to church. Um, I'm going I'm to wrap up. Uh, and I'm going to say a short word of prayer. And we can be dismissed. But I do want to, to challenge you guys. I'm not sure what we did last night. I see a lot of faces that are kind of like, you know. Um, I'm not sure if it's an energy thing or what. But, and I know you also went through what you went through downstairs. I know your attention span is shot right now. Uh, I get it. Nevertheless, uh, use every opportunity and every moment in the teaching and preaching of God's Word uh, to, to reflect on your own life, to think about what can I do to grow on a spiritual level? What can I do? Um, and even ask the question why you're here. If you don't know those questions, um, I'm sure you can talk to Jeff and others from church. How can I be more than what I am now? And maybe, maybe you identify with some of these characters that aren't as, as favorable. Maybe you see tendencies in who you are that more reflects the priest, more reflects the Levite, and not as much as the Israel. So uh, think about these things. Um, and, and I'll be sticking around a little bit if you guys have questions.
love to chat. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you. Pray you for your word. I pray, Father, for each and every single person here today. And I pray that uh, in light of what we have heard together, and in light of the gospel message, Father, fan into flame a passion, a desire to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Father, help us to even get uncomfortable and get out of our comfort zone so that we can glorify you. Help us to be uncomfortable for your name's sake. And Father, I pray that we may turn this world upside down for your name. Father, help us to do things that we can't even imagine and think about. Help us through who you are and what you've done in us that we might make a difference in this generation. So Father, go before us. Um, convict the hearts of those who need convicting Encourage the hearts of those who need encouragement and admonish all of us to live rightly according to your perfect plan for our lives. Um, I pray that you go before all these young people, um, whether they're going to college, whether they're going to return to high school, middle school, whatever the case might be. Father, I pray that as their student role, they may be able to devote themselves um, not only to their school, but their classrooms, their peers. How can they minister to them? Perhaps they're hurting people uh, in their circle of friends. Maybe once we're going through discouragement, depression, trauma, parent going through divorce, don't have a place to stay. There are challenges all around us. Father, help us to be that beacon of hope, that beacon of light uh, in the midst of the earth. Thank you, Lord, and we pray that you go 